686 uh, in the Old Testament. Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you that have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourself in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way, and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord, for he had mercy on them, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The New Testament reading is from Luke 13, verses 1 to 9, which can be found on page 76 in the New Testament. At that very time, there was some present who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked him, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, that they were worse sinners than any other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they do. Of those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were worse offenders than all other living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put, new, put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you, you can cut it down. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. your spirit and these words that you gave all those years ago may they call us back to a deeper trust and faith in you in Christ's name Amen so we are now in the third Sunday of Lent this season in the year that leads up to Easter Sunday which is coming up fast now, way back in the early centuries of the church, in those first centuries after the New Testament period, Easter, uh, Easter was the day that not only was Jesus' resurrection from the dead most fully celebrated and focused on, much like we do today, but it was also the day, the one day in the year, when the uh, new converts to Christianity 
joined the church. And they did that um, in kind of similar ways that, that we do. They made vows. Uh, they were baptized. And would also, they would at that time celebrate the Lord's Supper. Now, so on Easter Sunday, uh, those new converts to the Christian faith would come to the church gathering, and they would enter into the waters of baptism. It was a little that was it was done a little different than we do today. Um, they would first completely strip off all of their old clothes. We don't do that anymore, thankfully. Um, they would be taken down under the water, and they would be they would ra be raised up out of the water. And as they did so, brand new bright white robes were put around them. And after all of the new members for that year uh, were baptized. Everyone at the worship gathering would, would go to the meeting place, and they would all partake of communion. For the newly baptized, though they had been associated with, with this gathering of Jesus worshipers for a while, this day was the first time they were allowed into this part of the service. This was the first time you would be allowed to participate in the celebration of the Lord's Supper. So Easter Sunday was the day in the year new converts fully joined the church. It was the day when they would very publicly and fully, they do it not just with their words, right? They do it with their bodies as they were baptized and as they participated in the Lord's Supper. Even down to their clothing, they would very visibly and publicly align themselves with Jesus with both his dying and then his rising to new, glorified, resurrected life. This day was the culminating moment in their joining um, themselves to this, this new thing called the church. Which meant that leading up to Easter, leading up to Easter Sunday, therefore was a, was a time for these new Christians to, to prepare to learn, to learn about the church, to learn about what the church believes, what it teaches, um, for them to grow in their understanding about themselves and who they are and who Jesus is and who Jesus is for them. And so especially as the church is expanding um, in those early centuries from being mostly Jewish group of, of people, mostly Jewish Christians, uh, to now they expanded and they were becoming mostly Gentiles. So most of the converts were coming from not a Jewish background that had grown up following, following the Bible, following the God of the Bible, um, but now lots of these converts were, were coming from a background of having been enmeshed in all sorts of idolatry and pagan practices of, of the Greek world at this time. So for them to now suddenly align yourself with Jesus, and the one God who made heaven and earth and who has very strong feelings about things like idolatry and sharing allegiance with other gods and powers and so on, turning to Jesus for these people was a big deal because it meant that you had to really turn away from your old way of life, from the ways that you used to go about doing and understanding how life worked, even things like your life as a citizen where your profession were often enmeshed in these, these kind of pagan ways of understanding the world. And so to turn toward Jesus for them meant turning away from all of this other stuff, turning away from how you had grown up thinking the world worked. Turning toward Jesus meant renouncing old ways of living, old ways of seeing the world, and old ways of understanding how the world operated. As you had now turned to Jesus. And that's what you were doing on Easter Sunday, on that morning when you made your Christian vows, when you entered into the waters of baptism, and when you joined in in the celebration of the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper. And so leading up to that, the time leading up to Easter Sunday became a time of fasting and penance, and most of all, it was a time of preparation and repentance it's a time of repenting for these new Christians as they focused on turning away from their old way of life and 
into this new way of life that was defined by Jesus. And so that's where we get the season of Lent. The season of Lent grew out of this, um, out of this practice of preparing to join the church, preparing for a public profession of faith, for aligning yourself with Jesus. So it was a season, Lent became a season of repentance, which you did not as a bargaining chip, not as a way to maybe hopefully scrape together a bit of divine favor so you could escape some punishment. No, you did this. You entered the season of repentance because Easter Sunday was already set before you. The promise of Easter had already been made. So it was in light of that that you entered a season of repentance. Because repenting is never the cause of God's mercy or grace or forgiveness or goodness. Repenting is always the response to the promise of his goodness and his grace and his mercy. And our problem is that we don't like that. Now, I know that sounds really good on paper. But in reality, isn't our problem that we prefer to be the ones doing the causing rather than the responding? Because then, well, it's easy, right? Then, then I'm the one in control. If something good happens to me, well, I must be a better person than all of those other people. If something bad happens to you, well, obviously you did something wrong. You're not as good as me, or you didn't pray right or hard enough. He didn't do it with enough faith. Maybe there were some doubts mixed in. So you better get it right next time, right? Isn't that how we often think of how things work? And we like this, actually, because it lets us think we can be in control. And this is all part of our mindset that says, I can manufacture the outcome I want. That if I can just do the right thing, I can just say the right words in my prayer or work the right feeling, then God is going to have to give me what I want, right? God will owe me the perfect job with the boss who finally understands my genius. Kids that are always obedient and respectful, a perfect marriage or health, financial security or whatever it is. If I can just figure out the right things to do and the right ways to behave, then I can force God to give me these things because now he knows me. And so what happens is we start to view God as an adversary, someone who we need to manipulate because otherwise he's always there threatening to punish or take away, right? So when we come to this concept of repentance, we tend to come at it as if we are responding to a threat of some kind. Repent or else. So repentance becomes damage control. A response to a threat, a way to try to manage or avoid bad things happening. And so we even read in our Luke passage this morning, we may have picked up on it. Jesus says, unless you repent. This passage is tricky. Because when Jesus says, unless you repent, that sounds awfully hot, a lot like a threat, doesn't it? Don't forget, Jesus here is responding to something. He's responding to what people have come and said to him. A group of people have come to Jesus and they tell him about these other Galileans who, who had been killed by Pilate while they were bringing sacrifices to the temple. And we're not given everything they say to Jesus, but we do have Jesus' response. Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all the others. See, they were coming to Jesus with this assumption that because this tragedy happened, these Galileans who were killed must have sinned in some way to bring about this punishment. And then Jesus even brings up another situation. Remember, he says, remember those 18 who were killed when that tower fell on them? Do you think they were worse offenders than everybody else in Jerusalem? These people come to Jesus with an understanding of the world that says, if something bad happens to you, 
Whether it's a man-made tragedy like what Pilate did, or a natural disaster, or a random accident like that tower falling, whatever it is, it must mean it's your fault for not living right, or some sort of sin in your life. God has just been waiting for the chance to get you. They came to Jesus with the threat of God's punishment hanging over their head. Which, by the way, that mindset can always lead us to either arrogance or despair. But that's their mindset. That's how they view the world. And Jesus says, no. Were they worse sinners than everyone else? Were they worse offenders than all the others? Is it because they did something wrong? Did they forget to feel guilty or sorry about something? No. That is not why that happened. And that's where Jesus then goes on and says, but unless you repent, you all will perish as they did. But Jesus doesn't stop there either. He goes on to tell a strange little parable about a vineyard owner and a fig tree and a gardener. And this fig tree hasn't produced fruit in three years. And the vineyard owner says, that's it, cut it down. It's not doing what it should do. Then the gardener steps in. Let me have a go at it. I will tend it and nourish it. I'll cultivate it so it can begin to be the fruit-producing tree it was always meant to be. Jesus' call to repentance here comes in between his assurance that God does not operate in the way we tend to assume. Did these people suffer because they were worse than others? No. His call to repentance comes in between that rebuke of their way of thinking and this parable of the fig tree and the gardener who will not let our understanding of cause and effect play out without his intervention. Even though fig trees, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but trust me here, fig trees have no ability to repent, do they? <laughs> so isn't it strange that the parable Jesus tells immediately after calling people to repentance is about a fig tree with no ability in and of itself to, to avert danger by feeling sorry or guilty or summoning up the fortitude to just do better and next time and grow those figs next year. And it's a parable about a gardener who holds out a promise to the fig tree, a promise to do the work of growing and cultivating that tree into the fruit-producing tree it was always meant to be. I am convinced that at least one of the reasons Jesus brings up repentance here at all is that those who come to him, they are operating out of this mindset that says, it is all on us to get it right. And if I can, if I can do that, I can control God, and if I don't, then God is just waiting for the chance to punch me. So Jesus is saying to them, you need to repent of that. You need to repent of your belief that you can do anything to merit God's favor, and, you, and that you can likewise do anything to deserve it less. Again, this is a way of understanding the world and understanding God will always lead you to either self-centered arrogance or hopeless despair. And either way, it will destroy you. It will eat you up. So Jesus says, you need to repent. Jesus says to them, repent of your belief. You can muster up enough within yourself to do just the right things to make God owe you. And repent of your belief that your failures and your sin could ever disqualify you from receiving his grace and his mercy. And then Jesus tells them a parable of a gardener <coughs> who makes a promise to a barren, helpless, ill-behaved little fig tree. Repentance is important. It is profoundly important. Jesus is clear about that. What is also important 
is our understanding of what repentance is. The word repent is found in both the Old and the New Testaments. In the Hebrew of the Old Testament, it's the word shuv. What a great little word, shuv. In the Greek of the New Testament, it's the word metanoeho. Not quite as fun to say, a little tougher, that's okay. Shuv literally means to return. When we read in Isaiah this morning, verse 7, let them return to the Lord, that's the verse that's also on the front of your bulletin, that's that word. Let them shuv, let them repent to the Lord. And the Greek metanoeho means literally to change your mind, or, or even more, it means to reorient yourself. Reorient the way you understand life. So to repent is to return to the Lord, and it is to reorient yourself around not who you are or who you fail to be, but to reorient yourself around who God is. And it's to therefore turn away from our pagan idolatrous mindset that thinks we could ever do enough to earn or negate what Jesus has already done. And this will inevitably lead to our need to confess and to be honest about our sin. And that's why we do that every Sunday in church. We have that time of confession. But before we do that, we need to understand that repenting is not about managing or avoiding a threat. It is first and foremost, and it is fundamentally about responding to a promise. It is about responding to the God who has already said, come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You that have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Stop spending your money on all that is not bread, on all that is not nourishing. Stop working so hard for that which will ultimately not satisfy you. Come, eat what is good and delight yourself in rich food. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord. Receive his mercy. Return to God, for he will abundantly pardon. This is his promise to you. And the call to repentance is the call to respond to that, respond to that promise. It is the call to reorient yourself around this promise. The promise for you that has already been sealed with the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Repentance is not the cause of God's goodness and mercy and grace. Because that has already been promised to you in Jesus. So family, let us repent. Let us repent of our belief that we could ever earn this. And let us repent of our belief that we could ever negate it. Let us simply return and orient ourselves around this promise. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You that have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Come, eat what is good and delight yourself rich food. We return to the Lord, for he will abundantly pardon. <clears throat> for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. Family, Jesus calls us to repentance, not because he's holding a threat over you, but because he is holding out a promise to you calls us to repent, to reorient ourselves around him, because Easter morning and the empty tomb are sure and certain. Let's pray. Lord, as we 
as we are a people called to repent. Lord, open our eyes to the fact that you call us to repent, <coughs> not with a threat, but with a promise. You call us to reorient ourselves around you and around Jesus. Not to make you do anything or make you give us your grace and mercy, but because you already have done so. You have already made that promise to us in Jesus Christ. And so Lord, may we be a people who are bold in our repentance, who are bold in our confessions, who are bold with who we are, because we are bold in our knowledge of who you are. Lord, give us the assurance and the confidence of your children. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.